Hey guys. Um, I mean, I, I've attended this, uh, this many talks here at the family, so it's a pleasure to be speaking today. Now, um, observing many, many different presentations, uh, I really tried to make this deck for the family, and I'm somehow familiar with people who come here. So I really will try to keep this uh, presentation very useful for you, so you can come out of this um, and, you know, just uh, take a couple things, go apply them tomorrow. And if at any point you feel like it's boring, please uh, let me know and uh, we'll just skip this part and move on to the actionable items. So um, I think gross in general for many people, especially who are not marketers, is a little bit of a black box, right? It's, it's kind of this topic, okay, you have a great product idea. It also seems to be super cool and people supposedly will like it. Now, how do you grow this? And this question by itself, it can be easy when you when you don't touch it, but when you start touching this topic, you actually figure out like, oh my God, it's it's not so easy, right? So today I'll just try to um, transform this black box into a very digestible mechanism of how you can pretty much grow any product, any type of um, thing you're working on. Um, and uh, we will uh, also talk about some specific examples of Panta and um, other things um, I saw in uh, my experience. And maybe just before I kick off, um, I don't know if you um, had a chance to read a bit about uh, my experience, but just to give you a quick intro, most of the time I've been in marketing the whole life. I think I was um, kind of got into marketing when I was 14. I read Philip Kotler's book. Um, I think it was uh, it was marketing. And then I read another one that was said uh, it's a death of advertising and a start of marketing era and I kind of got into marketing since then um, studied in the US worked in Silicon Valley most of my career and moved to Berlin a couple of years ago now working with Panta and uh, head of growth in, in my case means that I'm just responsible for bringing customers in so acquisition but not only that and I'll talk about this as well uh, but just giving you a little bit of interest so you kind of understand where I'm coming from now uh, what I'm gonna cover today is really um, three things so first how do you understand the market, right? And understanding the market is not necessarily just um, thinking about uh, what to build, but more thinking about how to sell it. So I'm really gonna talk about it in the growth perspective. Um, second thing is go-to-market strategy. This is really like, how do you grow this thing? How do you go and make it happen? How do you bring the customers in? And the third thing is, is more a philosophical note to wrap it up. So it all starts with the who, right? Whatever you're building, uh, whatever you're developing, you, you are developing this with somebody in mind. You don't do it just abstract, oh, okay, it sounds cool, let's just do it. Um, and um, let's, let's talk about a few specific examples. Maybe some of you being founders or some of you being um, wor working for startups or companies can relate to this. So let's imagine you, know, you launched your MVP or maybe a new feature or maybe you launched some uh, some kind of small prototype and you're just testing it with people. So the thing you're really trying to understand is who is going to use it. And then what happens most of the time for many, many startups, especially working online, SaaS companies, etc., you get a different types of people using your product. Sometimes you have corporate sign up, sometimes you have early stage startups, sometimes you have people who do like something completely different, right? And we all at some point start asking ourselves, so how do we actually know which audience to focus on? Because if you're in a startup and you are multiple people and you always have limited resources, you can't address everyone, you can't make everyone happy, and at some point uh, you need to make some important product decisions. So this means you need to focus on some specific people. Now, um, let's, let's imagine the thing, um, you launched a hiring tool, and you, you have two types of people who are signing up for it. You have corporate signing up, and they say, you know, like, we really need it, uh, we just need three more features, five more things here, and we also need to do a few more demos, but we are really willing to pay a lot for this and really don't care about the money aspect at all. And then you have a bunch of startups signing up, and they want to pay, like, literally 10 times less, right? So the, the question you want to answer is, one seems really cool, corporates, you know, they sign up, a lot of money, promising, startups, uh, very, very different audience, paying less, how do you get more of them, how do you breach the cash cap? So this is a very kind of abstract example, but I think it's very common and I see it a lot happening, especially in Germany, where there is a lot of corporate innovation happening um, and uh, corporates are shopping around for technology. So it's just, it's just uh, something that many people face. So the, the way I would go about this, with anything that you're doing, you launch a new feature, you have a new product, you're launching a new startup, uh, you need to really choose based on three parameters, and this is what, what we've been doing at Panta as well in, in all my previous startups. So basically, um, 
First, you need to make sure that people have a need. Second, is that they have the urgency and the willingness to pay. So I think it might sound completely banal, but uh, in reality, when you start talking to people, when you do the demos, etc., cetera, um, people do sound like they want it. <laughs> many times they don't. Uh, many times they want it, but they don't want to pay. So screening for all these three is extremely important. And um, I, always, I always try to kind of uh, figure out who, who gives a bullshit talk where like, yeah, I really, really need it. But when it actually comes to the money game and like signing the offer, you'll wait for five weeks and then they will disappear. And who actually wants it because they use it. So um, I think this is just a kind of a theoretical question you need to answer very early and focus on the right audience. Now, but sure. Isn't the willingness to pay coming as the need and the urgency are really good? So, yes and no. Um, I think sometimes um, the, the urgency and the need uh, do not match with the financial resources. So, I, I can give you a specific. Uh, they might be not realistic, but people are not realistic about their, their needs sometimes, right? Like they will tell you one story, it will be another story in their head, and that's basically what I mean. Like, make sure that you know what they actually mean or what they actually can do better than they do. Uh, most of the time, they will play a game that they might not know what, what's the outcome, right? And I've been there many times uh, doing hundreds of sales demos uh, with a conversion rate of 2% exactly for this reason. Um, and then when we talk about who, I think um, it's, it's one thing to have an abstract understanding of who you are addressing. You can say startups and you can say corporates, but it's a very different thing to actually come to a very specific understanding who is your target customer. And this is really one, I think half of my presentation is really about this because it's so crucial for growth, you can't really uh, get this one wrong. So. Um, Persona's thing is, is probably, it looks straightforward, actually super hard to get right. Um, I also, when I talk to startups and I talk to a lot of early stage guys, I think many people spend a lot of time building prototypes, testing them, but not many people uh, spend enough time researching the market, talking to the audience and asking the right questions and questions actually matter. So um, I would say this is just a quick guideline of how, to, how you could approach um, persona building, obviously not the only one you can use, obviously there can be a ton of different options. Now, the way we did it at Panzer, the way we did it in a couple other companies is we started with an internal brainstorming session and you know, some of you who work with the team, even two or three people, you have a lot of knowledge internally, but it literally takes putting these people at one table and setting the right agenda for them to get this knowledge out. You need to ask each other questions, you need to talk to each other, you need to really get specific about who we're serving, who is this person, let's imagine where they went to school, who they are, you know, where they come from, what are their interests, how exactly do they come to the realization that they need this type of solution. Okay, let's walk through the steps, let's imagine their day, what type of shoes they're wearing, where do they buy their shirts. Like, you need to get really specific to an extent where you imagine these people and uh, I can tell you when we did this at Panta um, th actually the reason why we did it, it was because you know when I came in and I was um, the first gross person on board we had half of the company shouting let's do this another uh, part shouting let's do that um, and when we sat down to discuss the persona people figured out they're talking about very different personas this is this is a critical point to align your team as well on who you are serving. What's the target market, right? And then uh, once you have this, you usually have a document, two three pages. You have like a specific idea what what it should be. Then just go validate it, right? You can't be completely wrong. You can't be about right. So it really takes uh, talking to a few people. Usually 15, 20 is more than enough just to interview this exact profile of people and um, really screen them for a few elements that we're going to talk about and after this you get a good MVP of your persona that is a great starting point for all your growth um, efforts and I would uh, go as far as to say you can spend a bit of money on growth, you can even kind of start building your website but I would literally do the persona before I go into any website, redesign, building, setting up channels, writing ads, whatever. Now. Um, Many people ask me what, what is enough in terms of customer interest, can we do five? So there is no good answer for that, but you always know it's enough when you start hearing repetitive insights. So when you talk to people, you ask them something and then you start hearing the same thing over and over again, this basically means you probably hit the right spot and you got the answer to this exact question. So when you have the repetitive answers to all the key questions you're asking, this is the moment. 
Now, um, and I also included in the presentation, probably Arena will share it with, with everyone, um, this great guide to building personas. It comes from um, University of uh, Virginia Business School um, from a guy called Alexander Cohen. He actually did a great course. It's, it's called Product Management, but don't be misguided. It's actually a great guidance on growth as well. So I highly recommend everyone this course or just, uh, just to read these articles. Uh, super useful and literally like practical guidance. You take it, you, he, he has an agenda for the team session, so you can just take it all from there. Now, to be specific and to be helpful for you as well, um, I just put down some of the questions that um, I would say are really key when, when thinking about a persona. So um, when, when you think about persona research, um, it's, it's very important to ask the right questions because you can talk with people about weather, about what they like, what they don't like. It's not gonna be as helpful as it could be. Um, usually, for example, for us, our persona at Panta is small business owners. Uh, I'm not even talking about the fact that like a small uh, a German small business owner is not the friendliest person to connect with in general, right? So getting even half an hour of their time is challenging. Once you get this half an hour of the time or the CEO of a startup, for example, um, you know, we, we were talking to guys like AirHelp and others, now, you don't get much of their time. You have 30, 40 minutes. You got to use this time very efficiently. So the questions really matter, and bringing quality insights back is crucial. Now, um, so when you ask about the pain, you don't really ask them, like, oh, sorry, do you have problem with, like, managing your hiring? This, this is not how you ask it, right? Like, you basically go and try to understand very broadly, you start high level, like, what are the challenges in this area? And then you try to broaden it down to let them voice what they think of, the most valuable thing it brings is you actually understand what's on top of their minds. And really understanding what's in their head is the most valuable thing you can do because the moment you'll try to advertise to them, you also need to be aware how aware they are that they have this challenge or issue. It might be apparent from like a spreadsheet that they have a financial issue, but they have no, if they have no clue, they don't realize it, it's not gonna be helpful for you. Now, um, one, of the, one of the other things, um, uh, one of the other things you always want to check is they might say, oh, you know, I have a huge issue with hiring or like I have a huge issue with ma managing my marketing spend. And then the, the question that I always suggest to ask is like, how are you solving this? And many times you'll hear that people are not solving it, which basically means, yes, they do have a challenge, but it's not bad enough for them to solve. And this is exactly the urgency. So this is a very important element to check because if, if, they, if they have the challenge and they voice it, don't be misguided if they are not solving it at all. If, if they don't have you know, a solid reason why solve it right now, this might not be the right moment or maybe the right target customer to go to this with. Uh, or maybe you would have to do a lot more kind of urgency raising and education, et cetera, but then it, get co it gets costly. Now, um, you know, when building a product, and especially in early phases, when you're building a feature for an existing product, whatever, one of the key things you want to do is you want to understand what will make customers tick. And I don't think there is anything better than just asking customers firsthand what they see as an ideal solution. You will hear many different opinions, right? Like you don't want to build off one person's opinion, but if you ask 10, 20 people and you hear repetitive insights, you'll start kind of having this gut feeling telling you like, oh, Seems like this is actually, so this actually should be an MVP. We don't have it in MVP, and this one nobody mentioned, and this one nobody mentioned, and that one nobody mentioned, and this, this we actually had at uh, Penta and a couple other companies many times. Like people would say something that we didn't think about, people would also never mention something we thought about, and then you literally have to reprioritize your growth, um, uh, your product roadmap, and this is also a huge uh, part of growth in early stage. The other one is uh, where they'd look for a solution, and I think I wanna really, point your attention to this one. So if people say they have a challenge, and if people say, yeah, we're willing to solve it, it's high urgency, like I'm literally looking for solutions, um, this is how the ideal solution looks like, you really want to understand how they approach the search. There are naturally some products where people tend to trust word of mouth. Uh, for example, many times when you're looking for, for example, in some specific regions for a doctor, you would ask your peers, you would ask your family. Uh, we are now doing some uh, market research in Italy for Penta, and every second person says, I will ask my mom. Like, it's not a joke. They will actually go and ask their mom, which means you kind of got to sell to the mom. But uh, it's, it's a very important point to understand how people approach the search because when we interview people in Germany, everybody does online research. You can see it in Google ads, you can see, you know, like, you can see great search volume for some things. You go to Italy, you see almost zero search volume, 
But what you hear is like people just talk to each other all the time, all the time. They just talk to each other. They don't search in line. So if you don't find this out at the persona interview stage, you might just get the first channels wrong. So it's a very important thing to ask and get specific. If they tell you, oh, I read online blogs. What type of blogs do you read? Can you name a few? And then try to look if they read the same blogs. If one person tells you, I check this Facebook public, but nobody else ever mentions it, might not be the thing to do. But if they go specific and they really explain you why they look in that place and not the other, you're really getting down to how they think about the solution. I think understanding the way customers think at this stage about looking for this is the most important element. Um, the last one I would, I would talk about here is really how they make decisions. So um, for, for maybe my previous company, Bunch, it was, it was a very interesting use case where we actually used to, uh, we developed a tool for HRs. Now, <laughs> one big mistake we made, we thought that the HRs as, as a whole make decisions. And we went out, we started selling to HRs. Um, I think I did over 120 demos in two or three months. And that w the thing we found out basically is that the HRs don't make budget decisions, or they do, but it has to be under X amount of money, which is like, I don't know, 80, 90 euro per month, and then this doesn't justify the business model, right? So you gotta understand, are you talking to the person who will make the financial decision in the end? Is this the person who you sell to? Or do you sell to their boss, and they're just like one of the people advising for you? Um, so this is actually key to define the right positioning and channel strategy. Now, straight from the persona, and do you guys kind of get the concept why I'm talking about the persona so much? Like, is, do, you, do, you, do you feel it? Like, maybe raise your hand if you feel it, and don't if you don't. Okay, actually, uh, okay, okay. More, more or less, okay, fine. Now, go to market. So, um, this is a very specific, I would say, um, guidance on how do you actually start growth from ground zero. Um, and uh, I, I would say, kind of consciously or subconsciously, I applied it in every every job I was in, in later stage or early stage. I would say it actually works both in late stage environment and early stage environments where like literally two people. Um, the, the first thing you start with, you, you need to find the right metric to target. So um, we will talk about this one in a second, but this is North Star metric means this is one variable uh, that is the goal for the company. So if you are a team of, I don't know, 100 people, or if you're a team of two people, what is that key element, that key goal you're striving towards, and what's the metric? Second thing is fixing up the funnel. And this, is, this doesn't mean you have to have you know, a perfect onboarding process, a perfect product, whatever, but it has to be good enough to not waste traffic. Third one is selecting the channels to test. And you know, when you're starting anything new and you don't know what's the right growth strategy, you've got to test. Um, and the force is actually going and testing them. And making mistakes is absolutely compulsory in order to make success in the future. You gotta fuck up many times in order to get some things right. So um, I, just wanna, I just wanna ask you guys, what do you think was the North Star metric for Penta? And Penta, just for, you, for those of you who don't know Penta, Penta is a business account for small businesses and startups, right? So we basically provide business banking. It's like N26, but for business. Now, what do you think is our North Star metric? Uh, let's, let's, let's maybe go one by one and just raise your hands. Who thinks it's leads? Okay, who thinks it's uh, customers? Okay. Uh, traffic, uh, conversion rate, okay, MRR, uh, number of active customers, okay, uh, percentage of active customers, okay. So it feels like many people didn't vote, but uh, uh, it's it's actually the 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 number of active customers. And uh, let me explain you why it might be the r right thing or not. Let's see when we succeed or fuck up. Um, but the idea is the following, you know, like uh, traffic, leads, all of this is great. Customers, amazing. You can say you have 10,000 customers, but what if 2,000 of them, if like 20% of them are active? Does this actually make sense? Probably not. The percentage of active customers is an interesting metric. It makes sense when you are at like 10, 20, 30,000 customers, then it kind of makes sense to measure the percentage, right? But if you are at 10 customers and the eight of them are active and you show the 80%, it's not super meaningful. So until a certain point, what you try to look at is actually the number of active customers. And this is also something you sell to investors because it's a lot better to come and say, okay, we have you know 2,000 customers out of which one and a half thousand are super engaged. You can also say we have 10K and then you know like 800 sometimes log in. And then it sounds like you're developing something where you sign people up somehow. 
I don't know, maybe you promise them free everything and then they just never log in uh, and then, then that's not really a cool story, right? Now, um, let's imagine we together started Penta. Which channels would we test first? Um, let me also maybe go by a show of hands. So Google Ads, uh, SEO. Uh, it, 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 there, are, there are like two or three answers, so feel free to raise your hand multiple times. Uh, PR and online media. Uh, Facebook ads, referral, email marketing, okay, affiliate network. Okay, affiliate network, let me make a clarification here. Affiliate network, in our case, means business account comparison websites. Okay, well, huh? okay. Um, LinkedIn ads, sales, mm -hmm. events, direct mail. Direct mail is literally sending things over mail. <laughs> okay, okay. It's actually not so funny, you know, some people still use fax uh, for, for communication. We're seriously considering to test it. Um, yeah, so um, I think, I think uh, this, is, this is not, there is never a right answer, but this is how we approached it. So we started with Google Ads, basic SEO and affiliate networks. Why? So when you, when you think about 200,000 options that you have when you're starting a startup, the way you want to approach it is the following. Um, so if you go fishing, you can go fish in, um, in Spree, but chances you catch a good fish are a tiny bit low. You can also fish in the Bahamas where there is a lot of fish and then chances are higher. So we approach the exercise of selecting the first channels to test exactly in this way. We just asked ourselves, where would people look for a business account? And then from our audience research, from our persona, we also had some type of insights that suggested this would be uh, Google Ads, uh, basic SEO, meaning we just try to be visible in organic search, which is pretty much the same channel as Google Ads, just free, and affiliate networks, which is bank accounts, comparison tools and websites. So these are the channels where people are actively looking for the solution. Why these are the best channels? Simply because these people do realize they need a solution. Moreover, they uh, you know, put their selves at the desk, open their laptop and start looking for the solution. This means they're literally ready to go and make it happen for themselves. These are your best first customers. So you know, the, the first advice I always give to like early stage um, companies or people who are launching a new feature in an existing big company is always go and check the search volume in Google. If there is search volume in Google and you have a bit of budget, obviously go and do ads because these people realize they need it. Now, at the stage we're at right now, where we're a bit bigger and where we got already some, some efficiency on, on this kind of direct intent channels, we are deploying other things. For example, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, direct mail, by the way, it's super efficient in Germany, I have to tell you, sending mails at scale is one of the best acquisition channels, not only for fintech companies, but for many others. And uh, if you want, I can recommend you a great provider who, who does it like at scale. So basically, you buy a database of contacts, you um, run, a, there is a SaaS tool for sending these mails, and then you, you can even A-B test mails. It's, it's really cool, but it's super old school. Um, however, we are in Germany and it works. Uh, now, now, these are the, the channels where people don't necessarily realize the need for something. So for example, if you go on Facebook, you are definitely not looking to find a business account for a company. However, if we hit the right pain point, if we tell you, are you really, like it's Friday night, do you really wanna see it and do your accounting shit? And you're actually doing your accounting shit, you're like, yeah, I don't, let me check this shit out. So this is, this is something where you can catch people with the right messaging, just doing a little bit of homework on what people need. Again, comes down to the persona, your understanding of what it should be. And if you hit the right pain point, it can work. Uh, and then when we scale, when we have a huge customer base and et cetera, and we feel like you know, we wanna go beyond that, then we should deploy more channels. For example, events, large scale PR, and other things where people just don't realize the need for a bank account. For example, businesses in Germany on average have 2.8 bank accounts. And this means that many of them are all set. You, you can you know, try and call them for selling, et cetera, and they will tell you I'm okay. So what you need to do there is market education. You wanna convince them that going digital with their business bank banking is the thing to do in 2019, 2020, whatever it is. And this is very expensive because you will spend a lot of time, money, getting buy-in from influencers, from a lot of people to just support this message in the market and then it will happen. So the bottom line is 
when you start off, know where to look for people who already have a need and actively look for a solution. It sounds straightforward, but many people uh, get sidetracked because they went and talked to a friend over a coffee and the friend said, oh, we get a great amount of customers from Facebook. Maybe it's your channel, maybe it's not. So do, do think about this. Now, when you think about the funnel, so the funnel could be a very easy thing, could be just a landing page and you know, like converting people into the leads. Um, if you are a marketer, Many, many times, most companies, this is actually your area of responsibility where you just kind of need to figure out where to get traffic and then you need to convert you know, people into emails and then sales take over. Now, what I mean about, what I mean of kind of the, the good funnel concept to me and also what I mean by growth is actually this full thing. So when I talk about the MVP uh, version of the funnel, what I mean is check out your customer experience alongside your journey. So don't burn the leads, don't burn the people for nothing. Uh, rather try to understand their experience and fix up the moments that are super, super bad. So for example, you know, if you sign people up, but then they can't do anything. If you, you, know, if you just, just submitted your email, but then in order to log in, you have to use God knows what. And then when you log in, you can't do anything for another three weeks. And then there is some other issues when you try to use a certain feature. Maybe this is just not the right time to start marketing and you get a, gotta fix up the funnel first because you will burn money without any outcome. And this is not going to be marketing fault. This is just going to be the company not being efficient enough in its understanding of MVP. So do define your MVP in a clever manner where you don't burn traffic for nothing. And in order to convert traffic, and you'll probably get some on your landing pages, um, there are just some basic things to remember. So first is uh, position your product. Uh, there is an astonishing amount of companies, um, products, uh, product teams, other teams that don't do competitive research. I mean, they do. They check competitors' websites for five minutes and they say, yeah, okay, I got it. Like, you know, that's, that's not really competitive research. What you need to understand for every small element of what you're doing is what's exactly the difference between you and other people, not in your eyes, not in your technical understanding of the product. You know, because if, if you ask me how is Panta different from some other provider, I will tell you 20 things. What does the customer perceive? What's the difference? Most of the time, when you go on five different websites for CRM solutions, you will not see a difference. You as a customer will literally not understand what's the difference in between the solutions. So the way how you'll be making a decision is many times like, do you like the design? Is their sign up flow easy? Who are their customers, right? It's literally emotional decision making. Now people always make decisions emotionally, but you wanna increase the odds of them understanding your core value proposition, and you need to make sure that it's actually understandable for them. So try to position your product in a clear way. If you, if you do something that is really different, just say it. Um, and the second saying actually just super connected to this one, be human. Instead of saying um, full scale solution for managing you all your CRM funnel, say see all your leads and sales in one place. Like say it as if you were you would say it to a, fr uh, to a friend. And I think there are two different trends uh, where I think corporates and many other people are just going more formal with that language. But startups many times speak like literally bullshit language, almost uh, swearing, saying shit on their websites. And this is amazing because this is speaking customer language. Um, I think I did an interesting um, exercise with one of the companies I'm advising and uh, we, we literally went through interviews and we picked the language that the personas speak. And then we rewrote the website copy based on the terminology that that personas use. And we saw, we saw conversion rate just, just going up immediately because people could really understand what you're talking about. So look out for little elements that are not hard to fix, that don't require money, but that are kind of straightforward if and only if you talk to the customer audience. Now, one of the other things that happens, you, you're always late, you're always under pressure, um, not sufficient resources, you run late. So what happens is uh, you're finishing a landing page at 9 p.m. on a Friday and you're like, oh, fuck it, let's launch it, let's just launch these campaigns, go home, drink beer. Now, this is amazing and I really kind of, I've been there, done that, and I really understand that sometimes you just want to get things out and it's super valuable, but I think it takes a lot of courage and professionalism in each of us to actually go and say, no, we cannot do this. We better wait two or three more days because our quality benchmark is we want to make sure this is actually understandable. And what 
what you do is you just go to two or three or five customers you do interviews with and you ask them for feedback. Most of the time, they will just ask you 10 questions like, man, what, what, what does it mean here? S sorry, but like, is this, is this solution for that? Oh, no. Okay, sorry, I didn't get it. You will immediately catch a ton of things that you um, either catch with them or that you will pay thousands of euros to catch. So um, just check with your audience. And then um, once, you, once you have the first data, so you have Google Analytics, you have a bunch of other things, right? They show you what is happening. So uh, you get a good feeling of people react to this well or people react to it not so well. Now, why does it happen? Um, I think, I think there are very, very basic things you can do um, that people just don't do for whatever reason. Um, how many of you use on-page polls for whatever thing you're doing? Yeah, almost nobody. So uh, the, the thing I mean here is basically, imagine you come on a page, imagine you see low conversion. Now you don't know why people don't convert. Ask them a question. Is, is there information you're missing on this page? You can do this very easily. Hotjar, for example, has, uh, has a wonderful um, uh, poll feature on page. So it, it's 89 euros a month. It's not the cheapest, but it's really good. Um, at Panta, we do uh, weekly sessions where we actually analyze user feedback. We get a lot of it, and we change things on a weekly basis based on user inputs. We even <laughs> deployed um, um, a thing called um, uh, what, opt-in monster, and we display an uh, exit intent pop-up. We pay people 10 euros to give us feedback if they leave the website. We'll literally pay them Amazon gift cards. I, I, I do this every Friday myself, and uh, what we do is we basically ask them a bunch of questions around why they decided to abandon Pento website. The amount of insight you learn just by asking people for feedback is tremendous. And if you don't have this 10 euros per Amazon gift card, don't worry about it. Just ask people for feedback. There will be always a lot of people who will give you feedback for free. And understanding these insights, understanding the data you see is probably one of the most important things. And then if you don't have too much load, if you have some spare resource on a team, even a junior guy or an intern, deploy Intercom. Intercom is super time consuming. It's in my experience, it doesn't really help conversions many times, but it will it will let you hear a lot of questions. People will ask you so many so many things that you will actually understand how to adjust your website and how to make the conversion skyrocket. So what I mean is, when you have a first initial budget to test, don't waste it, but rather improve every week, every week, every week. And when you're planning this, do allocate time for this in advance, rather than thinking that you deploy a landing page once and then you never have to touch it again. If you improve weekly, your, in, uh, your results can be very different. Um, and I think just to wrap it up here, um, my point is re really never settle. So people who get initial success, initial traction, their products start trolling. They, they somehow get to, to kind of tend to get comfortable. They still have a lot of work, a lot of challenges. They need to report to investors, etc. But I think the reason why some companies, and you can probably relate to these examples, were really, really good in the start, and then they get worse and worse and worse, and you're like, I have really signed up for a different type of experience, is because they stop talking to customers. And uh, I mean, we all know it's, it's, it's hard to find time. You're super booked, you have a ton of meetings, you have a ton of things to do, your backlog is always full, especially if you're in a responsible position. Now, what really makes a difference is every one of us, be, be that a founder, be that an employee, really pushing for the company culture where people have to speak to customers on a regular basis. And this does make a difference. So if you speak to customers two, three hours every week, you actually always stay in touch with the market and uh, we have this uh, regular practice at Penta now. We, I think we lost the momentum for some time and now it's back. People post summaries on a general channel on Slack and the amount of impact it creates in a company is tremendous because they talk to a customer, even on a specific topic, they post it and people really start feeling like what's happening out there. Otherwise, you're just living in your own bubble, doing your own thing and feeling like you know everything and it's amazing. What if your customers are actually feeling pissed? What if they are doing something completely different from what you imagine? So staying in touch with them is really critical. Second is um, do experiment and don't settle for solutions that seem easy or that you're used to. Try to experiment with packages, with landing pages, with anything else, uh, also with your culture and uh, definitely with yourself. Um, when you work in a startup, and this is more like a personal efficiency thing, but you gotta work out the right habits, you gotta work out the right mentors, you gotta work out the workflow that helps you be more efficient and the company grow. And, uh, 
I mean, many people think, oh, it's okay, I just go to work, I do it, I become better and better and better. Keep in mind that always in the world there are people who do it a lot better than us and we better take them as an example rather than we just settle for what we're doing today. And uh, the third one is benchmarks really define who we are. I think um, sometimes if you are really good, if you are really fast, you outgrow competitors, you outgrow the market, you outperform your peers, and it's always important to move your benchmarks just like you move in the company. Because the mistakes that many companies made are really related to the fact that they looked at one competitor, they outperformed them, then they got comfortable, and in two years they got completely screwed by this new gig that came around. The reason is you gotta always move your benchmark up and find better examples, be that same industry, other industry, be that a person, be that a company that you really look up to. So at this, at this note, I just really want to wrap it up. Thank you guys for your attention and um, I welcome your questions. Thank you so much for the talk. Does anybody have a question? I can pass on the mic to you guys. Anything that, yeah? Hi, Ivan. My name is George. I, was, uh, I didn't know about Penta, so I was checking out the website, and I see that you have a little quiz on the pricing page. Is that a new thing that you're testing? Because I also see that there's a little pop-up asking for feedback if the pricing is clear, and that's one question. And the second question is, I see that you're passing through a query string if the company has been in existence or if it's founding, and also the pricing plan. Are you streamlining that information to different sales teams? Uh, so we don't have a sales team, um, and uh, we actually act as a pure SaaS as of right now. So the first question, yes, it's a test. Uh, we j Just to give you guys context, um, we are basically, you can display pricing plans, right? So you can say we have basic, advanced, and premium in the Penta case. Um, we figured out that people select tend to select basic. Why? Because it's free. Uh, why? Because they don't really get enough time to get familiar with the product. They just say, okay, fine, I sign up for something that is free and then I figure it out. Now, what we try to do is we try to write a few sentences where they are forced to select multiple things. So, for example, I am an owner of an existing or a company and foundation and I want the card for myself and one, two, three co-founders, maybe zero. I want card for one, two, three employees, right? When we put it in the perspective of their use case, uh, this is really a guidance for them to select the plan. We're yet to see how this test work, works out. This is literally one week old, but this was done actually based on this pop-up that you mentioned where people submit pricing feedback because many of them said, I have no idea how to select the pricing plan. Like, how do I know what's right for me? And uh, we can't do intercom right now capacity-wise. We also cannot do, cannot offer too many calls to, to kind of take it, incoming calls. That's why we try to do this quick fix. It's actually not working well for conversion so far, so we might kind of play with UX there, but it's an interesting experiment to see if we actually can increase the amount of paid plans we sign up. Because if we have a conversion drop of 10% and a 30% increase in paid plan selection, this is obviously better for the company, right? And then to your to your question about query string, et cetera, um, this, this is a non-optimal technical setup that is more like you know something we're looking to fix, but it's, it's helping us um, just understand which pricing plan people uh, choose. Um, in, in a few weeks, hopefully, this, this whole pricing plan selection thing will move further down in a sign-up process, which is why uh, I always um, I always look at this slide and when I see my job, I also go here and I go here and I go there. So this is part of the effort of like improving the whole user experience and we will change it. Yeah. Hi, Ivan. Thanks for your presentation. My name is Sam. Uh, my question for you is you briefly mentioned there was a guide somewhere for building personas like mm -hmm. for our customers. Um, and there was a link, I saw it on screen. Yep. Obviously, I can't click it. Could you tell us the name and where to find the information and so on? Thanks. Uh, ah. Yeah, all get the ah, all is revealed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, uh, yeah, if you guys get the presentation, you can you can click the link. Um, I can also share it uh, in, in additional notes, but this is a great course. And actually, if you go on Coursera, most of the time you'll see that this course is still available. I had a couple founders I know actually do it. Um, and I always recommend to do it before you start building or in the process when you're building. It will really kind of fuck you up in a good way and then let yourself build it back up in a better way. So highly recommend it. I did it myself, although I'm a marketer. It's a product management course. It teaches you everything from agile to testing, etc. But one of the key things it does to you, it explains you how to build a product from ground zero and pretty much anything that you build, be that a landing page, the websites, you know, like a set of channels to test, it's kind of a product. 
Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was super insightful. Uh, my name is Christina, um, and I wanted to ask because it sounds all amazing, but the bottleneck I always experience is collaboration with the product team. So if I want to do any changes on the website, it takes either weeks or months, or there's always other, another priority. So how does the growth team kind of collaborate perfectly with the product team to make sure that these changes are happening? Yeah, I think it's an amazing question. and. Uh Panta is the first company where I did it right. Um, before that, I always struggled, just like you. Um, so we have a full stack uh, marketing team. It means marketing team has its own designer, has its own developer. We're fully independent in anything we need to do. And whenever there is dependency, I make it my full-time job to either hire a, a person for us, freelance, whatever it is, or kind of absolutely book a, per a time of the right person, right? For example, now we had a blocker with DevOps, server stuff, redirect, et cetera, important for SEO. Um, and I basically said, guys, we, we, we either like hard agree that this person has 30% capacity for us at all times, or we get our own person freelance, and I will get the budget for this because I will go and justify it, right? So building your own full stack team is actually very, very important. It's it's probably less important when you just start off and you know you literally have one or two dev guys writing the code. Fine, you can do without. Uh, one other recommendation I want to make: use freelancers. Um, when I joined Penta, and actually until probably February, April this year, I've been working alone as a full-time growth person at Penta. We reached 7,000 customers, which is a lot for this industry. And the reason why I accomplished this is because instead of hiring full-timers who are very expensive and, by the way, extremely tough to find, especially SEO and good performance people, uh, I hired people in freelance, uh, and they've been doing an amazing job. Don't hire juniors. Don't uh, try to save money too much. Try to hire seniors on freelance who really know what to do, but don't do this before you understand what they need to do. So the right moment to hire freelancers is when, for example, you want to make a test, and by the way, maybe this is a good thing to mention, when you want to test a channel, for example, Google Ads or something else. Uh, I can tell you, if I go start testing Google Ads myself, I will not trust the results I get. But if I get our guy, Matthias, to do the exact same thing for a new product, I will absolutely trust the results. Because you got to get the person who really knows how to do things right to test something. Do invest an extra thousand euros to hire this person and get them do it from A to Z and help them with landing pages and other stuff that you know. But do get a right person to test. Because otherwise, you might get misleading results that are actually wrong. So this is, this is an important point to think about as well. Anybody else? Okay. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Daniel. Thanks for the talk. And um, you mentioned in the talk uh, that you get ideas for things you test from your competition, from doing internal brainstormings, and from uh, doing user research. Uh, is there any other so th sources you take for inspiration um, for finding ideas how to grow? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think reading books is an essential thing to develop, um, and also de uh, kind of enabling others in your team and your organization to read, uh, be that bo books, articles, or whatever else, is amazing. Uh, looking for benchmarks in in very different industries is important. Uh, I think one of the most the two most important things that I somehow related is one is behavioral economics or like behavioral psychology, basically how people behave and make decisions, and then Ariely is a great guy to follow in that space. Um, and then the second one is basically newer science and really understanding how the brain works. So literally getting nitty gritty scientific and now thanks God there are people who make it digestible for us normal people who don't really understand all the biology behind it. But uh, going into those aspects, going a bit deeper and understanding human behavior is, is something else that really, really helps when making the right calls. Plus also, um, I think uh, we will make it now a, a culture like almost a weekly or bi-weekly exercise looking out for hacks in the internet. Sometimes people try things and there are a lot of people who, write, uh, who like to write about their successes or failures. So instead of us spending a lot of money or like reinventing the wheel, we just got to find the right information. The reality is most of us are too busy to do this, like literally too busy. We just don't have time, right? You, you barely have time to catch up on your emails and still your inbox is probably 80 emails full in the end of the day. So you probably 
probably don't have enough time for research and even if you book it and then you get distracted on Slack, somebody calls, just falls, uh, falls back. So my solution to this is again, hire a freelancer who will do research for you. I employ a great person from Hungary through Upwork. Uh, she's just 20 bucks an hour. She does an amazing job. She can research anything for us. She can scrape all of the internet. It will be 20 times cheaper for the company than if I do it. And it's also very good quality. And then you just take this information and take 20, 30 minutes to read it while you're commuting on, uh, on Uban or S-Ban. And this is a very efficient way to do this. So do enable yourself and do build the process that lets you collect information without investing hours of time into collecting it yourself. And I think uh, it's a great question you ask, right? Because if you write this type of specification, if you develop like a certain guideline for how you do this, at least on a monthly basis or bi-monthly basis, you can actually enable a person in your team, a junior or a freelancer or somebody else to help you out collect the groundwork. And uh, when we started off, for example, with Hotjar that you mentioned, uh, we, we, I literally had to copy information from Hotjar, translate, etc., put it on all in one Google Sheet. Now we have a process, and every every Monday I have fresh insights in one Google Sheet, organized, marked in a special manner. We we took a few weeks to figure it out, but now it takes me uh, probably 20, 30 minutes to read through all the feedback we got from the website in the, in the previous week, and then spend another 20, 30 minutes planning the adjustments for the website high level, and then maybe another hour to just specify them and put them into uh, into a design backlog of our designer, right? And so if I do it on Monday and the designer has it on Tuesday in their backlog, uh, by Wednesday or Thursday we have a full thing done and then our developer will make it happen on Thursday and Friday. So by Friday, the things that people requested in their feedback that makes sense to us will actually go live. And this is a very quick turnaround time, but you gotta build the right process for this and also prioritize accordingly, enable people and explain why this is important. Okay. Cool. Thank, Thank you, you guys, guys so much. Good luck on the lead.